So uh, when I was a young adult, um, I went to school, uh, uh, college for a couple years in California, but uh, eventually I left my home area in Southern California uh, to uh, move near my girlfriend who was in college at NAU in Flagstaff, Arizona. And I finished out my schooling there. Uh, but uh, I still had some friends back in California who I'd visit from time to time. And my best friend from high school, a fellow named Cliff, I especially enjoyed visiting uh, when I could. And uh, at this time, he lived in a apartment with his girlfriend and I don't know what it was but uh, especially at this time when I was kind of 19 20 uh, I was especially kind of carefree and I like to be spontaneous and more than once I would show up totally unannounced at his house you know when I was living in Arizona just knock on his door and be like hey I'm here I'm gonna hang out for a few days and uh, and he was always very gracious about it I think he kind of enjoyed it too he was kind of spontaneous I don't know if his girlfriend did looking back uh, but, you know, he was mostly okay with it, but I look back now at my behavior and I think that was kind of rude, right? To just show up and assume someone has time for you and wants to put you up. Uh, I never really stopped to think at that time how showing up might inconvenience them. Uh, maybe they, they had other plans. Maybe they were planning on going somewhere. Uh, maybe it was a busy week. Uh, maybe they wanted some couple time. Uh, but I was young at the time and a bit more self-centered and those ideas just didn't cross my mind too much. So, so I would just show up. But you know, as I think about today's world, it's true that we don't really like unannounced visitors too much, right? Uh, most of us experience life as quite a busy thing, and the idea that someone is just going to show up and, and expect something and inconvenience us uh, feels pretty out of line, uh, doesn't it? And you know, that's why gated communities exist, right? People want to control their environment. That's why online shopping exists, so we don't have to deal with people at Walmart. Uh, that's why uh, none of us want to be hassled and slowed down. That's why we don't necessarily like telemarketing calls. That's why even when religious people show up, you know, if you ever have someone knock on your door, have you ever thought about it? And you're like, no, and slam the door. Even me as a pastor, I don't want to talk to people door to door with their uh, saving us from hell thing. Uh, so, you know, these feelings of annoyance at being inconvenienced are in a way understandable. You know, there's just so much going on in life and we're marketed to and there's lots of stuff. But you know, in a hyper-busy modern world, sometimes we treat even our loved ones, uh, like their presence, also as an inconvenience. You know, there's a lot of studies out showing that there are many kids out there who feel like they have to fight for the attention of their parents, right? Their parents have other things going on, their work or their whatever they're, they're into. Uh, there are relationships that seriously suffer really commonly because all of us many times are more interested in our phones than our family, right? We have some little app we want to be in or some conversation on our phone. There are elderly parents who feel like they have to make an appointment with their kids in order to get any attention attention. Uh, we've gotten so good at not being bothered, at kind of created gated community lives, that sometimes we don't even want to be bo bothered by the important stuff because it might get in the way of our stuff, whatever our stuff is. And for many of us, even the important things shouldn't show up unannounced. You know, it's interesting how often in the Bible, God's appearances to humans involve the idea of negative feelings. Uh, God shows up, and so often in these stories in the Bible, people feel troubled or perplexed, and most commonly, afraid. There are so many biblical stories where God or God's angel shows up, and the first thing that God or God's angel says is, do not be afraid. And I assume they say this because I imagine, you know, people when they initially meet God or God's representative usually feel kind of afraid. And why are they afraid? You know, if we think about it, put ourselves in their shoes, I think there's a number of possibilities that probably all have some merit. Uh, one of those is that, you know, if you imagine like being in the presence of the power of God when you're just this small little human, it probably feels kind of scary. I mean, if you've ever been to a zoo and seen a really large, powerful animal like an elephant or a bear, it's fun to look at it through the glass, but imagine you're standing there with no glass. You probably just feel kind of vulnerable and here's big God and, you know, what's going to happen when, when God God's not in a cage when God's right here. Another reason for that fear might be that we are afraid when God shows up that we're going to be punished. You know, it's like being called to the principal's office or the boss shows up in your little cubicle. Like, what have I done wrong that the boss wants to speak to me? Now, that might be another reason. 
But there's a third possible reason why I think people in the Bible are sometimes afraid of God's direct presence, and that's the one I want to focus on. I think people in the Bible are sometimes afraid of God's direct presence because they are afraid of what God is going to ask them to do or what God is going to do with their lives. Right? They have their lives worked out, uh, and they're comfortable with how their lives are worked out, and they don't want God to show up unannounced and mess it all up and make them do something else. They are afraid of the inconvenience of God's presence. And this sense is actually really common in the Bible. We have, for instance, maybe the greatest example of it, uh, the story of Jonah, where Jonah is supposed to be this prophet of God, and God wants to send him to Nineveh, who are these enemies of, of Israel at this time. And, you know, he, uh, Jonah doesn't want to go preach to the enemies. And so it's kind of funny, you know, if Nineveh's this way on the map, uh, it says he heads on a boat going the opposite way, which doesn't end very well, right? He gets swallowed by a fish and all this stuff. But, you know, there it is where God shows up and Jonah wants to do the exact opposite. We have Moses, right? Great Moses, one of the great leaders and, and heroes of the Bible who continually argued with God to try to get out of his calling. And he came up with every excuse he could to say, you know, you've got the wrong guy, basically. You know, he would tell God, I'm not powerful enough. I'm not a good speaker. I have a stutter. No one's going to listen to me, right? These are reluctant messengers of God in many cases. And this tendency to fear God's interaction in our life is what makes Mary and Joseph's story that we hear around Christmas all the more re remarkable. You know, it's easy to jump to this idea that, oh, it must have been an honor to be God's family, uh, to be God's parents. And yeah, I guess it must have. But I think sometimes we also forget the dis disruption and how scary it must have been for God to show up and, and say, here's, here's what I'm going to do with your life when that wasn't your idea. Because much like the other characters in the Bible, in the story where Gabriel shows up and announces God's plan to Mary, it's a different story than we have today, but it says uh, that, you know, I don't want to say Mary's close to God's calling, but the Bible says her initial emotional response is that she feels perplexed, troubled, and afraid, right? So even wonderful Mary initially is like, oh my gosh, what is going on that God would show up? And then in today's story where we meet more Joseph, uh, before God explains God's plan to him, uh, he's ready to separate from Mary, right? He's not on the same page. His best guess on why Mary is pregnant is that she's been unfaithful. And being a really nice guy, he wants to just let her go kind of uh, quietly rather than humiliating her or getting her in trouble. Uh, but, you know, uh, this was not his plan either. And it's not something he understood until God showed up and blatantly told him in a dream. And would you blame them if they were confused and overwhelmed in this time, right? We have to imagine that Mary and Joseph, you know, Joseph's this guy with a good carpentry job, and Mary's, you know, basically a nobody, no one knows who she is. They have a good thing going in their relationship, right? They could start a family, and they probably have a sense of what their lives are going to be like, probably very similar to what most people's lives are like. And those ideas almost certainly didn't involve Mary becoming pregnant by the Holy Spirit, that was not the plan, or at least not Mary and Joseph's plan. And yet the amazing thing is that when God shows up and tells them that they're going to be the parents of God's son uh, and save people from their sins, as it says in today's reading, uh, Joseph immediately just says, okay, you know, kind of goes along with the plan. In the story about Mary, she has this beautiful response where she says, here I am, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your will. You know, is there any better response in the Bible of God's calling? Here I am, a servant of, your Lord, of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your will. You know, I think a lot of times the idea of God's direct presence in our lives would scare us too. You know, we're more comfortable with a God who's mainly a set of ideas. You know, God has love and God has justice and God has all this stuff. But, you know, ideas, not too much directly involved because that's a more manageable God. Uh, the God of ideas is a God we can kind of put in a drawer when we don't need him and then pull out if we're in trouble and maybe pray if we're really in trouble. Uh, the God of ideas doesn't show up and inconvenience us and ask anything of us. The problem, though, is that this God is not the God that really exists. This is not the God of the Bible. The real living God shows up, often unannounced in surprising ways. Uh, the real God shows up in, in Jesus and doesn't just love us, but kind of says, follow me with this way of life. And he doesn't really care what our plans are. You know, he says, too bad, this is your plan now, to love God and love your neighbor. 
And, you know, maybe we don't see God and God's angels as directly as we sometimes see in these stories. Uh, maybe that's not the way we encounter God's presence most of the time. But, you know, one of the things that says in the Bible all over is that the Spirit's always with us. And every moment in our lives is a calling. And even though we can't necessarily get into the specifics of what your calling is, I don't know what your exact calling is from God, uh, you know, it has something to do with loving God and loving your neighbor. And on one hand, we kind of have a sense of what it is most of the time, right? We don't necessarily want to do it, but we have a sense of God's calling in our lives. So if there's something we could take from this story of Joseph and Mary, uh, what if it would be that the prayer we would offer God wouldn't just be, here's what I want, but we would offer ourselves as openly as Mary did with her words back to God, right? Here I am, a servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. What Mary and Joseph teach us is to get beyond the initial fear of what God's plan for our lives is. Because at the end of the day, if God is really loving and the creator, creator of the universe, God's plans for our lives is actually better than our plans for our lives. So once again, today we join together with Mary and Joseph in making Mary's prayer our prayer. Here I am, a servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Amen.